Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and that is the time that we've set aside for our Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm grateful that you are able to be with us today. I believe you're going to find this week and probably next week, I can't imagine I'm going to get through uh, this week's subject matter in a single week. Uh, we'll see, but I doubt it. I think you're going to find our Bible study this week and next week extremely inspiring and uplifting. We have been in the course of a study that I've titled Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night, All Things Paranormal from a Christian Perspective. Uh, as I've said many times already in the two weeks that we've done our studies. Uh, I want to make it perfectly clear. We absolutely believe in the spirit world. We absolutely believe uh, that paranormal, as it were, events are possible and that they do in fact occur. Uh, we may differ on the source of those events, uh, but you'll understand better as we get deeper into our study. Please bear in mind, I'm trying to walk through in an organized fashion, so uh, if we don't hit upon a subject this week that you're particularly interested, just stay with us. We will get there. And uh, as we title each week's Bible study video for our YouTube channel, we will be um, including at the end of the title in parentheses what the subject matter for that particular week was. So if you look at the playlist for this Bible study, you'll be able to go down the list, look at the titles, and you'll be able to see each week what the subject matter was specific to that week. Week one, for instance, we began with the importance of the foundation of God's Word, the Word of God. And then uh, last week we were talking about uh, the spirit world and the fact that the spirit world does in fact exist. The Word of God tells us this. But before we move further in the study, let's open with a word of prayer. Master, we love you, God, and as always, we thank you for every single opportunity that we have to break open the bread of life, to learn, to grow, to benefit from the wisdom and the truth that the Word of God offers us. Lord, I am not so foolish as to believe that I am capable in and of myself to provide the people of God with any inspiration, any hope, any truth, any revelation outside of the divine anointing of the Holy Ghost. And therefore, I ask God that tonight you would anoint the messenger, anoint as well the ear of every hearer. Help our hearts at this moment to be cultivated by the Spirit of Almighty God to receive the Word of God as good seed upon good ground. Master, reveal yourself, reveal your truth through your word this evening, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. So I was saying, there is absolutely a spirit world, and the spirit world consists um, basically in uh, just three levels or three areas. You have God, who is a spirit, you then have angels, and you have demons, okay? In a nutshell, that's kind of how it works. And uh, so you have God, you have angels, you have demons. Last week, we were looking at the nature of God. We were looking at how the spirit of God manifested himself in human form for mankind's benefit, uh, through the person of the man, Jesus Christ. Now, this week, we want to look at angels. And again, this is probably going to be 
two weeks worth of study. I might be wrong, but I doubt it. Um, the exciting thing is, a lot of people, when we talk about the paranormal, when you watch these paranormal TV shows and what have you, uh, it amazes me how quickly people want to jump over. They don't believe in God. They have no faith. They don't approach anything from a biblical perspective. So when uh, a figure appears on the scene and does something good and beneficial and positive for an individual, and then they disappear, as it were, and they say, you know, gee, this guy helped me. I had a car accident, and this man ran and came and helped me, and then... When I wanted to thank him, he was gone. I don't know where he went to. I don't know where he came from. Well, people in paranormal circles immediately want to jump to the notion of, oh, this was a ghost. You know, somebody's spirit was just, just happened to be walking down the road that day. And uh, this particular person's spirit decided that he was going to be helpful. Well, those of us who believe in the Word of God and those of us uh, who trust the Scriptures believe that God uses angels oftentimes. So a lot of times what people experience in the way of paranormal that is positive and good and beneficial and life-saving and however uh, you want to define it as positive and good, a lot of times what they are experiencing is an angelic visitation. It is still paranormal. It is still supernatural. It is still um, the spirit world, as it were, uh, encroaching upon the natural world. But in those instances, it's very possible, if not probable, that they are experiencing a visitation of angels. The very word angels that we read in the King James text or in the Bible is defined in the Greek as angelos, a messenger, envoy, one who is sent, an angel, a messenger from God. This is one reason why in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> the Lord actually refers to pastors of churches as the angel. Uh, of the church because they, they are a messenger, an envoy, one who is sent. Um, but obviously, uh, angels, as we generally define an angel, is a spiritual being who is a messenger, an envoy, uh, one who is sent, an angel, a messenger from God. One of the most important scriptures that helps to define <clears throat> the work of an angel is found in Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? All right. So they are sent forth by God to minister on behalf of God's people. And uh, that is the purpose they serve. They are ministering spirits. Okay? And then secondly, they are sent forth. We do not pray to angels. We do not invoke angels. We do not call them out by name. We don't pray the quote-unquote St. Michael's Prayer, which is idiotic. An angel can't be a saint. To be a saint... You have to have been born again. You have to have been redeemed. And angels are not in need of salvation through Jesus Christ. So there's no such thing as angels being saints. That's an idiotic notion. But we do not invoke angels, nor do we pray to angels, nor do we worship angels. There are religious um, uh, practices out there where all of these things are done. Of course, you can look at the Roman Catholic Church and you see them invoking angels and speaking to angels. We do not 
uh, have any power with the angels. The angels, according to the word of God, listen carefully, are sent. That means the angels are always uh, under the management, under the control uh, of the authority of God himself. They're under the Lord's authority. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, uh, please send your angels to, you know, fight this battle for me or to do whatever might need to be done. That is okay, but we always address God. We do not address the angels. The same is true of praying to uh, saints. Um, I, we're going to get into it when we get into the notion of ghosts and hauntings, uh, but we're going to be talking about the fact that the scriptures teach that the dead know nothing. They have no inheritance in this world anymore. They are not connected in the least to this world. They have been fully and completely disconnected from this world, and they now are on a very different plane. As such, God has told us in the Old Testament law not to practice communication with the dead, not to try to communicate with the dead. And yet there are religious practices out there where people are praying to saints and praying uh, to dead people, praying to their relatives, praying to their ancestors. And uh, uh, that is a forbidden practice. Our source, our help is always God. We don't need anybody outside of God. The whole reason Jesus Christ came was so that we could walk in relationship with him. And so it's kind of like a married couple. You know, you get married and uh, the wife has issues with her car or has some kind of issue at home. And she calls her dad, her mom, her brother, her sister, whoever. And when her husband finds out, he said, well, why didn't you call me? And she said, well, you know, I didn't want to bother you with it. And he said, well, but that's the whole reason we got married. You know, when we got married, I'm your, I'm your go-to. I'm the one that's supposed to be there for you. And so the same is true when we become part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. We are married to the Lord. We are engaged, as it were, to the Lord. We will be married after the wedding supper uh, in glory one day. But uh, we're to go to God. He is always to be our source. And we are never to go to those who have passed on, be, be they, uh, you know, believers, apostles, what some call saints, uh, whatever the case might be. The minute we start engaging in these kind of practices, we are in effect making an attempt to communicate with the dead. Again, as believers, the Word of God is our authority. And as our authority, the Word of God says, the dead have no inheritance, meaning they don't own anything anymore. They don't have any rights to anything in the world anymore. And the Word of God said the dead know nothing. They are completely disconnected, which I'm grateful for. I have a great-grandmother that I adored uh, more than any person in this world. And I think she was one of the greatest Holy Ghost-filled Christian ladies that this planet has ever been graced to uh, host. And uh, when my great-grandmother died, I never one time had a desire to talk to her. I never one time had a desire uh, to communicate with her, to hear from her, or to try to communicate with her. Why? Because as a believer, I know what the Word of God says, and therefore I honor that, and I'm fine with that. My great-grandmother in this life, she loved her kids, her grandkids, her great-grandkids more than anything in this world. She devoted her entire life to her kids, her grandkids, her great-grandkids, 
Her husband had divorced her way back in the 1940s, and she never remarried. She never, in all her years, she never remarried. And uh, she was just so devoted to her family, to her children, to her great-grandchildren, so on and so forth. And the notion that my grandmother is floating around, you know, and checking in on everybody and stopping by. First of all, she had 10 grandchildren uh, just with my mother's parents alone. So her daughter, my mother's mother, uh, and her husband, my grandfather, had 10 children. And then her other daughter had three children. Her other uh, son had another couple of children. So uh, my great-grandmother, being as devoted as she was in life to all of her kids and grandkids, my goodness, she would have had, you know, 16 just grandchildren. And then great-grandchildren were in the dozens. And uh, where's she going to go? Where's she going to hang out? Who, what, is she going to favor one over the other? You know, is she suddenly become God so that she's omnipresent? Has she suddenly become God so that she's able to be in a number of places at one time? You see, we start getting into some dangerous territory, folks, when we don't stick with the authority of the Word of God. Now, concerning angels. Angels are often referred in the Word of God. Uh, they're referred to as holy angels. Just like uh, in Scripture we read about demons and devils, and they're referred to as uh, unclean spirits, you know, and wicked spirits. In the case of angels, they are specifically referred to as holy. In Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Luke 9, 26, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Uh, many people don't understand in Scripture, we often see the angels referred to as the sons of God. That term is used, the sons of God. And I specifically spoke when we talked about God manifesting himself as the man Jesus Christ. I shared that with you partly to draw the distinction between the only begotten Son of God and those that are otherwise, uh, the term is kind of loosely used, Son of God. But the word of the Lord tells us in Hebrews 12 and 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So this is not an issue of God somehow or another, you know, uh, procreated and gave birth to angels. No, he created the angels, but in that he is the creator that came forth from him, and therefore uh, they are, in effect, the sons of God. Now, we read about the fact that angels are ministering spirits sent forth, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. In Psalm 103 and verse 20, the word of God reads, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, listen, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice 
of his word. So when God speaks, the angels immediately respond. They do his bidding. There are any number of examples in the word of God where angels are shown to be doing the Lord's bidding. In Daniel 6.22 we read, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. In Matthew 1, 18 through 21, uh, at the birth of the Lord, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So here we see that not only are, do angels physically show up on occasion to minister on behalf of God's people, but according to this, they also can appear to you in a dream. They can appear in dream form. And again, this is another area where people claim to have had paranormal experiences where uh, someone appeared to them and spoke to them in a dream, you know, and uh, sometimes you get these people, oh, I have a guide, you know, I have that, and and it, <laughs> it may very well have been a one-off, and God was simply trying to communicate something to you that you needed to hear, and you needed to understand, and he did so through the course of a dream. In Matthew 28 and 2, uh, this is speaking of the Lord's resurrection. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Luke chapter 119, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was visited by an angel. Uh, Luke 119, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. In Luke chapter 126, the Virgin Mary received a visitation by this same uh, angel Gabriel. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. In Acts 5, ver verses 17 through 20, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. In Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 11, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. Now, mind you, this angel had to have physically been present because he literally gave Peter a whack to wake him up, to stir him, to wake him up. And, uh, he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not 
that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he was that he saw a vision. When he passed the first and the second ward, they came into unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So the angel leads Peter out. The chains that were on his wrists, I'm going to use the term loosely, magically, supernaturally, just literally fell off. The angel leads him out through the prison. Somehow they're passing guards, they're passing guard stations as it were, and yet they're not seen. They go out of the building. He brings them to the gate of the city, and the word of the Lord said, and the, the gate just opened to them of its own accord. So they didn't see anybody opening the gate. He brings them in. They passed the first street, and the word of the Lord said, at that point, the angel's work was done. Boom, he disappears. And it's only then that Peter kind of comes to himself and realizes, wait a minute, I, I thought I was having some kind of a dream. I thought I was having some kind of a vision. And yet now here I am in the middle of the street, you know, and everything became very real to him at that point. Um, Isaiah 37, 33 through 36. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So you see angels acting on behalf of the Lord, angels doing things that God has sent them forth and commissioned them to do. Um, in Zechariah 1, 8 through 11, I saw by night and behold a man riding upon a red horse and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom and behind him were there red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, small l, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show these what I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Now this is exciting because the word of God says that our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, roameth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Here in Zechariah, we see that God has sent angels whose only job it is to patrol, hallelujah, to travel throughout the earth, to go to and fro. So while the enemy is out there looking to destroy you and to cause you distress, God has angels that also are on patrol. Hallelujah. We are not without a spiritual police force, folks. We are not without representatives of heaven whose job it is to minister on behalf of those who will inherit the kingdom of God. That same passage, Zechariah 1, 8 through 10, in the NIV reads a little bit more clearly. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine, with red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? 
And the angel who was speaking with me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Hallelujah. So isn't it exciting to know, praise God, that uh, the angels are not merely standing in heaven waiting to receive orders from the Lord. No, uh, he has angels that he has sent forth to patrol. Hallelujah. To keep an eye on things. So they are always at the ready to minister on behalf of God's people in moments of duress or trouble. In Revelation 22, verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. In Revelation 22, and verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Revelation 16 and 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, within the spirit realm there is God. Then you have angels. Of course, that's a whole another segment of the spirit world. There is a hierarchy within the the angelic realm. There is a hierarchy as well within the demonic realm. We'll be getting into that in another week or so uh, in a lot more detail, but I'll share this with you. In Daniel 10 verses 10 through 14, And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. He's saying, from the first day you began to pray concerning this matter, he said, I was en route. Now listen to verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, three weeks. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, there is a hierarchy. Just as we have within our civilization countries, we have borders, we have boundaries, countries, we have states, we have cities, we have counties, we have municipalities, uh, towns, and what have you. Uh, there are spirits that literally are assigned to oversee these various divisions, these various uh, areas. When I move into a new city, every time I've pastored over the last 40 years, when I move into a new city, I ask the Lord to show me, Lord, what is the prevailing spirit that resides over this city, that, uh, that exercises his influence over this city? Uh, I can tell you, when I got to Dallas, I didn't even have to ask him. The Lord spoke very clearly to me, and it was very unusual. It was something I'd never heard of before. But he told me, he said, there is a spirit of pretense that dominates the city of Dallas. Well, the longer I lived there, the more I saw it. You have never seen a city in your life that is as pretentious as the city of Dallas, Texas. And I know some people might be offended by that, but I also can tell you, I've spoken to any number of people over the last two decades, and they've said, man, you, you ain't lying. 
Uh, I lived in New York City for 10 years. I lived briefly in Atlanta, Georgia. I've lived in a number of cities around the country. I have never seen a place where people are so uh, caught up in appearances. They are so caught up in uh, things have to be shiny and pretty and fancy. You have to live in the right neighborhood or else they don't even want to know you. You have to wear the right kind of clothes. You have to have the right kind of labels. You've got to drive the right kind of car. you got to have the right kind of job. You better have the right kind of address. Um, it, I never saw a place in my life. I lived in New York City for the whole decade of the 90s, and I'm going to tell you something. People in New York City are nowhere near, near, nowhere near, as pretentious as Dallas, Texas. In New York City, you can have on this, I worked in real estate in New York. I have a real estate license in New York State. And uh, you can have the richest of the rich living on this street, and two blocks away, there's a public housing complex. Those people walk the same sidewalks. They pass each other by. They interact with one another, you know, uh, employees and the dry cleaners and at the gym and wherever else, the grocery store. And people are nice and they're, they're decent to one another and all this. And I could go out and play pool. I love to play pool. And I used to play in a pool league, for that matter. And I'd be standing there at a pool table in New York City, and I'd strike up a conversation with somebody next to me. And before too long, we became good friends. I have a number of friends to this day that I just met playing pool in New York. I'd come to Dallas, and Tommy and I would go out to play pool, and I would try to talk to somebody near me at the table. Literally, folks, I'm not even exaggerating. And they would look at me like, well, who are you to even talk to me? And then they would turn their head just as rude, as obnoxious as you please, and walk away as if you were nobody. You were nothing. And this happened over and over and over again as I lived in Dallas. You'd be talking to people and they'd say, oh, you know, so where do you live? And you'd tell them, oh, well, that isn't a highfalutin neighborhood enough. That isn't a rich and, you know, uh, impressive enough neighborhood. So they literally, I'm not kidding, folks. They literally in the middle of the conversation would just, oh, uh -huh, and walk away. That spirit, that pretentious spirit, dominates that particular uh, area. And every community has one. I preached in a church in uh, East Texas years ago. And uh, they had invited me to come and preach a revival. When I went to uh, the church the very first night that I went, I had never been to this town before. As I went to this church this night, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, the presiding spirit, the predominant spirit over this community, listen to this, is a spirit of witchcraft. And I thought, wow, well, that, that's a pretty powerful demon to be uh, in, you know, over a, a city, you know, or over an area like this. And uh, I mentioned this in my preaching in this little church I was preaching in. And uh, I wound up preaching there for months. We had a marvelous move of God. I preached there for many, 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 many weeks and months. And uh, one night a lady came into church and they were having testimonies where people can stand up and share what the Lord has done for them or what have you. And this one lady stood up and she said, you know, the first night that Brother Charles came to preach for us, he said that our city has the spirit of witchcraft that is the predominant spirit over this town, over this city. And she said, 
I happen to be watching Phil Donahue. Some of you are too young to remember Phil Donahue, but uh, he was pre-Oprah Winfrey and, you know, uh, uh, pre uh, Jenny Jones and uh, Montel Williams and Wendy Williams and all that. He was long. He was one of the very first uh, hosts who would do these shows where he'd bring in panelists and they would talk about certain issues and then he would allow members of the audience to make comments and ask questions. And she said, "I was watching uh, Phil Donahue and he actually had." representatives from the Church of Satan, a satanic movement, on his show. And they were talking, and he said something to them about, uh, basically, like in the line of, well, there must be certain parts of the country, you know, like the Bible Belt and stuff, you know, you're, you're probably not real active there, he said, but there must be certain parts of the country where, you know, you kind of uh, have more of a following and stuff. And she said, and the man said, we actually have three what we refer to as Satanist capitals in the United States of America. And he said, one of those capitals is Salem, Massachusetts. The other capital is, I want to say, San Francisco, California, if I remember correctly. He said, and the third one will probably surprise you. He said, it's a small Texas city called Athens. That's the city that I was in. That's the city that the Lord had shown me was the spirit of witchcraft was dominant in that city. Um, I met demoniacs in the local Jesus name Pentecostal church in that community. The pastor had people in his pew who were as demon possessed as anything I've ever seen in my life. And the pastor just never dealt with it, never said anything and these people did nothing but cause trouble in the church and push people out and uh, they created more backsliders than the church could produce uh, converts. I mean it was an, a mess. They just created such a mess out of that church in that community. But the spirit world has structure. This is true both in uh, the the uh, realm of angels as well as in the realm of demons. So he said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, so the dominating spirit over Persia withstood me, Daniel 10 and verse 13, withstood me one in 20 days. But now listen, but lo, Michael, one of the the chief princess, notice the language, one of the chief princess came to help me. All right? So we see their structure in the demonic realm and their structure in the angelic realm. There's a prince over Persia, and then he says Michael is one of the chief princes, one of. So Michael is not the chief prince. Those who try to suggest or teach that Michael is somehow a unique angel, that he is a chief magistrate and a chief authority in the kingdom of God and in the uh, work of angels, no. He is one of the chief princes. The term that is used, prince, is sarar. That is a, a, a Hebrew word. means to be or act as a prince, to rule, to contend, to have power, prevail over, reign, govern, to rule over or govern or to lord over. So, there is a hierarchy, both in the angelic realm as well as in the demonic realm. In Matthew 9, 34, but the Pharisees said, speaking of Jesus, he casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. 
Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Mark 3, 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. And by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. So there were men in the Lord's day who tried to say that Jesus Christ had authority over devils. And he was casting out devils because he was doing this through uh, a demon that had higher authority and more power. Uh, and this was the accusation that they made. Now... Satan himself is referred to as the prince of this world in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And then in uh, John chapter 14, 30, again speaking of Satan, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath and hath nothing in me. John 16, 11, still speaking of Satan, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Ephesians 2 and 2, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So here, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, is referred to as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh. He literally has authority. He literally has power over the environment. He literally has power, not just on the surface of planet Earth, as it were, but in the atmosphere. And, and I'm not going to go into great detail today on this, but this is one reason why uh, music is something that's very important. And that we be mindful of the type of music that we use and type of music that we listen to. Because... Uh, traditionally, there are certain instruments, there are certain types of sounds that have been used to conjure demons and conjure devils. If you go to uh, the African continent, if you go to um, some of the less developed tribes and you look at their religious practices when conjuring demons and what have you, they generally would use instruments with a low sound. For instance, a drum. They love to use drums, okay? And yet, in the Word of God, when you read the, the uh, David, the psalmist, writing about worship and encouraging God's people to worship and telling them how to worship, he's always referring to high-sounding instruments. Not low-sounding, not low-vibration instruments, but high-sounding instruments. Timbrels, tambourines. Uh, he says the high-sounding trumpets, uh, the high-sounding um, timbrels. And so uh, it's as if when we, you know, I literally go to church on Sunday, I play my timbrel, you know, I play my tambourine, and I've been doing that as many years as I've been pastoring, and before church starts, ask Tommy, I'll be sitting there, and I have these videos I put together that are just different gospel music songs and what have you that I really enjoy and that bless me, and I'll be praying and listening to that music. And uh, sometimes I'll sing along with it, and I grab my tambourine, and I start beating on my tambourine, because high-sounding instruments are used to worship God specifically. And what happens is you are literally, <coughs> excuse me, disturbing the environment. You're literally pushing negative entities and negative spirits out of the environment. 
when you use these high sounding instruments, okay? And so I literally just start beating my tambourine. And it is amazing the difference that you feel when you're in a place and they're playing music and a tambourine is playing. And when you're in a place and they're playing music and somebody's beating the fire out of a drum set and whacking that bass drum up one side down the other. You get a whole different vibe. You get a whole different feel from those different types of instruments, don't you? Okay, but I, I can't get into a whole lot of detail on that. One day, perhaps we will. In Scripture, there are three types of angels. We read of cherubim, who are mentioned the most in Scripture. They are commonly seen guarding the presence of God and the things of God. One cherubim was placed in the Garden of Eden to guard the tree of life. Two were placed in the Holy of Holies, uh, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, to guard the presence of God. Excuse me. They remind us to be zealous about guarding God's glory and his worship as well. Worship must be in spirit and in truth to be acceptable to God, and therefore we must guard against anything uh, that in pretense does not align with Scripture. Then there are seraphim, and seraphim, pardon my hair, are only seen in Isaiah chapter 6. They worship God's person and cleanse God's people. They are the burning ones, quote-unquote, who remind us to be zealous and passionate in our worship and service and also in cleansing ourselves from sin. Finally, we also read in the Word of God, and by the way, you can uh, read about cherubim, for instance, in John 4.23, you can read uh, concerning the, the uh, seraphim, Romans 12, 11, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And then we read about what are referred to as living creatures, which are seen several times in the book of Revelation. They, like the seraphim, continually worship God. They are like God's priestly worship leaders who stay around the throne offering worship and leading others in worship. They remind us that we're a holy priestly people who should be consumed with honoring and worshiping God in everything we do. Read 1 Peter 2 and 9 and leading others to do the same. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, it speaks of the Lord Jesus in saying, who is the image of the invisible God. It's saying that the Lord Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. This is, when you say the firstborn of every creature, basically you're saying that obviously there is no father above him. Because when you, uh, whether it be ducks or deer or human beings, they all descended from parents. He said, but Jesus is the firstborn of every creature, meaning simply that there is nothing beyond him. He is God. There is nothing beyond him. It says, who is the firstborn uh, of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be, now listen, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. Now remember, he said, be they visible and invisible. So there are thrones, there are dominions, there are principalities and powers in the spirit realm, even as there are in the natural realm. 
All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. See, this is what I'm saying. He is before all things. That's why it says the firstborn. Because there's nothing past him. There's nothing beyond him going backward, okay? He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, within the angelic realm, we read of archangels. You've heard the term archangels. Archangels in the Greek, archangelos, uh, means a, an archangel or a chief of the angels. The term archangel occurs only twice in the entire New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then in Jude 1 and 9 we read, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring accusation against him, uh, excuse me, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee which is really interesting because the Jehovah's Witness cult tries to tell us that Jesus is Michael the Archangel and that God turned him into the man Jesus and that as a man he was nothing more than a man and once he ascended back to heaven he went back to being Michael the Archangel. Yet interestingly enough, this passage tells us that when Michael was disputing with Lucifer, Satan over the body of Moses, Michael had no authority whatsoever. He could not rebuke the devil in and of himself, but rather he had to invoke God by saying, the Lord rebuke thee. Okay? He didn't have the authority or the power to rebuke the devil in and of himself. Now, the notion Oh, let me see here. The notion that uh, some of these cults and some of these false religious teachings uh, bring, they say, well, but Michael, uh, it says that he is the archangel. But we also read in Daniel where Michael was simply one of the princes. Okay, one of those in higher authority. And yet in uh, Jude it said, yet Michael the archangel, and they turn around and they try to extrapolate from this use of, of language, the archangel, that he is alone, the singular archangel. However, that logic is absolutely insane. In Matthew one twenty. We read, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, the angel of the Lord. Does that mean then that God only has one angel? Saying Michael the archangel is like saying Michael an archangel, just as in Matthew one twenty the angel of the Lord appearing unto Joseph in a dream, that this is not saying that there's only one angel of the Lord. No, but rather that he is an angel of the Lord. But in the old English usage, they would often use the term the rather than an. In Numbers twenty two twenty six, and the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place. Again, does that mean there's one angel of the Lord? Judges 6 and 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with me, thou mighty man of valor. Does this mean that there's only one angel of the Lord? No, of course not. In Judges 6 and verse 22, for clarification of this notion of an angel versus the angel. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, 
Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So you see, those terms are used interchangeably, an and the. It by no means does putting the in front of Michael, the archangel, by no means does that suggest to us uh, with absolute certainty for certain that he is the the only, you know, the singular archangel. No, he is an archangel. Now, as it would appear, according to many who teach such things, that Michael is uh, a top-rated or top-ranking angel, if not the top-ranking angel in God's heavenly host. He will play a special role in the rapture of the church if you believe that the term the angel, the archangel, means there's only one. But the word of God said the Lord's going to appear with the voice of the archangel. So an angel is going to make a declaration at the Lord's appearing. It doesn't mean that the Lord is going to have an angel's voice and therefore the Lord is an angel. And see, that's how we know that uh that Michael the Archangel is really Jesus, and Jesus is really Michael the Archangel, because after all, it says he's going to um, appear with the voice of the Archangel and with the sound of a trumpet. Well, is he going to have the sound of a trumpet coming out of his mouth as well? No. What we're seeing here is a very classic representation of royalty being announced. You know, I love to watch the um, British Parliament. I love when the king or the queen, the sitting monarch in England, uh, speaks to the joint house of lords and the house of commons and all of the people uh, in government come together. And he or she, nowadays it will be King Charles, uh, speaks to them. And I love the ritual. I love the tradition. It's, it's very regal. It's very inspiring to watch um, when the representative from the House of Commons goes to the Chamber of Lords and he, he knocks on the door three times and there's actually a, a worn out spot on the door from hundreds of years of this continual uh, ritual, this practice that has been uh, tradition in England for centuries and centuries. and uh, But just like when the President of the United States, uh, we're soon going to see uh, President uh, Biden speaking to Congress and, you know, the Joint Houses, Congress and Senate, uh, for the State of the Union address. And as the president enters the room, there is a declaration made, you know, uh, Madam President, uh, the President of the United States. And, you know, people stand up and they, they applaud him as he enters. This is, um, this is what we're seeing uh, represented in Thessalonians, when the Apostle Paul said, the Lord himself shall descend with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of a trumpet, we're going to hear a declaration. Oh, hallelujah. Behold your king. Glory to God. I believe that's what the archangel is going to say. Behold your king. And then the trumpet is going to blow. And that is the... Uh, the pomp and the circumstance that is going to precede the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds to redeem his church. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So now, according to, according to other religious history sources, there are seven archangels uh, and you know, some of these sources are questionable, so by no means am I saying this is a fact, but they are named as Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, Seraquel, Raquel, and Remiel. Each of these angels have a role 
according to tradition assigned to them by God. The earliest reference to a specific system of seven archangels appears to be in the uh, the book Enoch 1, the Ethiopian eunuch, where the angels are listed as Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Raquel, uh, Zerechiel, and Remiel. In the Catholic Church, three archangels are mentioned by name in its biblical canon, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. Raphael appears in the uh, Deuterocanon, Can, canonical book of Tobit, where he is described as, quote, one of the seven angels who stand ready and enter before the glory of the Lord of spirits, a phrase recalled in Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 through 6, which reads, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God, out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So this This is kind of where we get the notion that there are likely to be seven archangels that literally are in effect, they are the closest to God. Those seven angels are the closest beings physically to the presence of God. Now, if we look again at 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If you look at Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, this is what the Lord had to say to Job when Job was really... Uh, having a pity party and uh, getting real upset about things. And in Job 38, 4 through 7, <clears throat> Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Meaning, who has measured it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and listen, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So there's a good possibility that at the time of the rapture of the church, that if there be seven archangels, that we're not going to hear merely the voice of the singular, a singular archangel, but rather they all, just like at creation, they're going to shout with joy. Hallelujah. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the, or an archangel. Okay? So, It might also be interesting to point out that there are seven continents, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. And as we know, there is a hierarchy, as we know, that demons and angels uh, are given uh, authority and they are given uh, the power to oversee given geographical areas, perhaps the seven angels that are closest to God are 
the seven angels that God has placed over the continents, each angel having authority over or uh, the responsibility of overseeing the seven continents. That's just speculation, so I'm not offering that as absolute fact. Okay? Um, and... In Matthew 24, verse 31, listen, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So there again we see uh, the great sound of the trumpet. The angels are being sent to gather God's people from all over the planet. So it makes sense that perhaps these seven angels have authority over the seven continents. In Mark 13, verse 27, And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect <clears throat> from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Michael is specifically mentioned uh, in Revelation 12, 7 and 8. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So see, again, you're seeing uh, hierarchy. You're seeing Satan, represented as the dragon, has his angels, his subordinates. Michael has his angels, which are subordinates, okay? And it said in verse 8, And prevailed not, meaning Satan did not prevail, neither was their place found any more in heaven. In Daniel 10, 13, we read it before, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Notice how that Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes and not the singular chief prince. Angels, of course, are mentioned uh, all through the word of God, but I, I'm going to uh, share some anecdotal stuff, I think, uh, to close out this session, and then next week I'm going to go through a number of passages in the Word of God <clears throat> where angels are mentioned, and in reading those, we will learn more about angels, what they do, and how they operate. But the Word of God told us that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister, to do, to work on behalf of God's people. And uh, over the years, I've, I've had any number of experiences. I do not claim to have ever been visited by an angel. I'll tell you that right now. That is not a, an experience that I've ever had. Uh, but I have heard, and in some instances firsthand, uh, from pastors. I know one pastor many years ago talked about he was having terrible, terrible trouble in his church, and uh, there were issues that were arising, division, people were biting each other and tearing at each other, and he thought that his church was literally going to wind up just having to close down. Uh, problems had gotten so bad, and there was so much trouble and strife and negativity. And this pastor prayed and prayed and prayed, and he said, Lord, please, Jesus, somehow, Lord, please help us in this situation. Something has to be done. The enemy has crept into the camp, and he's caused all this division and strife and trouble. And he said, Lord, please do something. And one night he was in his study, and he had a great big Great Dane dog. And his Great Dane would lay on the floor nearby him as he was at the desk in his study, and he said all of a sudden he saw his dog perk up and sit up and was looking, and he turned, and he said there was this beautiful, great, big, tall man. He said this guy had to be eight feet tall. He was taller than the doorway, standing off to the side of him. And the first thing that an angel, read the Word of God, look at the record of Scripture, 
when an angel appears, one of the first things an angel generally is going to do is speak peace to the situation. God does not operate in the realms of fear. So one way to know whether something is of God or not, if it inspires fear and nothing is said or done to quell that fear, then you can know it's not of God. You can automatically know that it's not of God. Because when an angel appears over and over again in the testimony of Scripture, the first thing the angel will say is, fear not, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Okay, and when the angel says this, this is not just him encouraging us not to be afraid, and then we are still terrified. No, when the angel speaks this, he literally is speaking peace to the situation so that the person who is hearing these words will tell you immediately I just was at ease. Immediately I was calmed and I knew that I had nothing to fear. I was not in any trouble. And this angel said to him, fear not. And he said, the Lord has heard your prayer. He said, and we have come to uh, deal with this situation in your church because there was a spiritual element to what was going on in this church. The enemy was planting seeds of division and strife. Same thing is happening in our country today, but there are Christians who are too stupid to realize what's going on, setting brother against brother, uh, citizen against citizen, people making all kinds of harebrained, ridiculous accusations and creating all kinds of ungodly um, conspiracy theories. And this is the work of Satan. This is what the enemy does. Division and disharmony will destroy a nation. Jesus, the Lord said, a, a house divided against itself will not stand. Abraham Lincoln quoted that uh, himself. He said, you know, uh, he wasn't speaking for himself. He was actually quoting scripture. But a house divided against itself cannot stand. And we have seen foreign governments using the internet. A lot of this has been the byproduct of the introduction of the internet. People believe every stupid thing they read Every harebrained kookamonga out there uh, that has a keyboard and a, and a monitor can put out all kinds of ridiculous conspiracies and lies. And, and so all of a sudden in our country now, we're tearing ourselves apart. And people in this country, especially those on the right, are too foolish to recognize that we have been played. We are being Played. We are being forced to devour and destroy ourselves. The Russian leader, going back to the 1950s, said we won't have to destroy America from without. He said America will destroy itself from within. So the same kind of division and strife and negativity that we see in the country today this poor pastor was dealing with in his own church, and it was the same type of operations that demons were involved in that was causing all this in his church. And he said, this angel told him, you know, we have come to help, you know. And he said, and then as fast as he was there, he just disappeared. And he said, well, what does he mean that they've come to help? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The angel told the man, he said, come here. And he brought him to the window. And the man looked out his window. And he looked at his driveway. And on either side of his driveway, he said, there were lines of angels standing on either side of his driveway. He said, literally, shoulder to shoulder. He said, they looked like a fence. He said, these men were beautiful uh, in appearance, they were beautiful men, said they were strong, muscular looking, said, and they were tall. They were at least eight feet or so tall. And he said there were lines of them on either side of his driveway. And then at that point, 
they all disappeared and he's standing there by himself. And he said, obviously, he began to praise God. He said, I don't, Lord, I don't know what you're doing or what you've done. He said, but hallelujah anyhow. And he began to worship the Lord. That Sunday, he went to church. And he said he was sitting in the platform before the service began. And there had been so much negativity and so much horrific stuff going on within the church. And he said all at once, he said, I literally saw those columns of angels walking into the church. He said two by two. And he said that they entered the back door and they went and they came down either side of the sanctuary. And he said, and they stood there. And he said, I knew that God was doing something. And he said, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord descended, oh, hallelujah, on that church. And God began to touch people's hearts and melt people's hearts. And people who had been at odds with one another, people who had been argumentative and and uh, disruptive and creating all kinds of issues, literally begin to go to one another, weeping and asking for forgiveness of one another. And just all this wonderful move of God took place. But there was such demonic activity involved in this that the angels, in effect, had to come to keep all that negativity out so that God could move. And that's, that's one uh, example of an instance, uh, probably one of the most dramatic that I've ever heard of over the years. I remember some years ago, I also saw a story of a young woman on a college campus. Uh, they were reporting that there was a man who was attacking women and raping them and what have you on this campus. This was easily, oh heavens, oh man probably 40, close to 40 years ago, it was early in my ministry, I saw this uh, story. And uh, so uh, the internet and computers and phones with cameras and uh, security cameras weren't everywhere like they are today, you know. And they had reported roughly what uh, some of the girls who had been attacked told them, you know, um, what kind of build he had, and he wore, uh, I think he wore some sort of a ski mask or, you know, something over his face and all this. And uh, this young lady was a Christian, and she was praying, and they were telling people, you know, uh, do not walk campus alone. Don't go anywhere alone if you have anything to do. Make sure there's at least two of you, so on and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> so this one evening she had to do some studies at the library or whatever the case might be or uh, you know I'm old I don't remember all the details quite as well as I once did but she had to be out late and she had to go back to her uh, apartment she actually had an apartment near campus she had to go back by herself and she said that as she was walking she saw a man in the bushes hiding and he met the description of what they have reported the attacker looked like he looked to be about that height he was wearing the kind of clothes the other girls had said that he wore and uh, she was terrified and she said oh jesus oh jesus help me lord to get into my apartment safe help me to get into my building safe and she, you know, got her keys out and she got up to the door and that guy never moved. He never did a thing. She's all by herself. And she opened the door and she went inside and immediately she called campus uh, security. And they came and they found the guy in the bushes hiding there. And they pull him out of there. He was the attacker. He was the guy who had been attacking girls. And... Uh, she said, she said, I had to ask him. I, I just had to ask him. She said, so I asked him, I said, why in the world did you just let me walk by? Why, you know, why did you not uh, approach me or, or, you know, or attack me or anything? And this guy literally said to her, oh, come on. He said, what do you think? I'm crazy. He said, well, those two huge guys you had on either side of you. He said, what, what am I, stupid? 
And she said, what two guys? What, what's he talking about? I didn't have anybody with me. I was by myself. And the guy said, yeah, you had two guys with you. You don't, don't stand there and lie. You had these two huge guys with you. So you see, the word of God said, the angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. Hallelujah. And believe me, there's many circumstances in my life when I've called on the Lord and said, Lord, the promise of your word is the angels of God encamp round about them that fear him. I need your angels to set up camp around me because I'm going into a very scary or dangerous situation or a difficult place. There was another incident I recall of a missionary. He and his uh, family had gone to a very, very remote place where there was a tribe of indigenous people in another country. I want to say it was New Guinea, but I'm not sure. At, again, at this age, you got to give me a little attitude for lack of memory. And uh, his family uh, got themselves a little shack, you know, that they could stay in. And uh, he said that at night, the, the first night came, he said, the people of the village all came around the house and they were standing around the outside of the house, the perimeter, and he was looking through an opening and watching them. And they were standing there and they were just kind of looking and he couldn't figure out what on earth that was about. The next day, uh, he began to try to communicate with uh, one of the leaders in that community. And that person said, you were in great danger. These people uh, are cannibalistic. They're cannibals. And he said, you were in great danger. Last night, they came. They the, the, All they saw was fresh meat. They, they didn't... Uh, they, there was no welcome for you. They were not interested in your being in their community at all. They had no interest whatsoever in your being here. And uh, the man said, well, but why in the world did they just surround my house and, and they didn't attack? And this other man who was, from what I understand, uh, spoke their language and was from another tribe or what have you, a nearby community. So he, he interacted with these people at some point and in some way. And uh, he talked to them and they said, uh, the shack was surrounded by these huge men. And he said, and they, they, they said, and they were shining like the moon. They were shining. And uh, the missionary thought, oh my God, have mercy. The Lord sent his angels, hallelujah, to protect us and to keep guard over us. Surely the angels of the Lord and camp round about them that fear him. And as it happens, because they saw this that night, they came to this missionary and th through the interpreter said, we do want to know about your God. We want to understand. We've never seen anything like this. We want to know about your God. And when it was all said and done, many, many, many from that tribe were converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. So folks, I'm sure many of you have heard stories. You've seen stories on television, you know, uh, anecdotes on uh, YouTube and what have you. So one thing we need to bear in mind when we look at the paranormal from a Christian perspective, uh, not every supernatural, not every paranormal experience is necessarily negative or demonic in nature. No. In some instances, we may actually uh, be dealing with an angel of the Lord. The Word of God tells us, and we're going to get into this next week, how that uh, we need to be careful when we're entertaining strangers because many have entertained strangers unawares who were, in fact, angels of God. So angels can appear as strangers. They can appear. But it's interesting, again, God never wastes one word. Everything he says, he says, for a reason. But interestingly enough, he said, strangers. 
meaning someone not known to you. God does not use your dead relative to come and speak to you. God does not use your dead relative to come and communicate to you. No. If he needs to use an angel to do something for you or to help you in some way, it is going to be someone you don't know. It's going to be a stranger, somebody completely unknown to you and most of the time unknown to everybody uh, in the community or, or, you know, in that situation. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, that stranger without fail just simply disappears and nobody knows where they came from or uh, where they went to. I'll share this one last anecdote before uh, I finish up tonight. I was pastoring my first, excuse me, my third church, which was my first apostolic work. My first two works were part of the uh, Church of God denomination out of Cleveland, Tennessee. And this was my first apostolic work. We had rented a beautiful church building out in the country. It's very secluded. It was out on a little country dirt road. It was really out in the boonies. But we had people that came to church. I'll tell you what, we didn't have the trouble we have today getting people to come to church. And... Uh, we had had a real wonderful service, and a lady from a nearby church similar to ours, um, from the United Pentecostal Church, a lovely lady. I had gone to that church before uh, fully coming into the apostolic movement, and then eventually the Lord opened the door for me to start this church up the road almost 20 miles and she had come to visit this particular night. I can't remember if it was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. But at the end of the service, we were all talking and chatting and visiting. And we were kind of making our way. I think we were going to go out and grab a bite to eat or something. There were about five or six of us, and including my, my younger brother. And uh, we're chatting and talking. And we're, we're going out on the, the porch of the church, you know, and I'm locking it up so we can leave. And this lady says to me, she said, you know, Brother Charles, I had a dream the other night. And she said, and in my dream, she said, you were standing in front of this really large church building and the doors were open and you were standing there kind of greeting people as they came in. And she said, but the part of this dream, this lady was Dominican. She was from the Dominican Republic. And she said, but the part of this dream that absolutely thrilled my soul, she said, the people that were coming, she said there were hundreds of people coming, just like a flood of people coming. And she said, it was the most diverse group of people that I've ever seen in my life. She said there were uh, Native Americans, there were people of color, there were um, uh, Indian, um, from India, you know, folks. Uh, she said the, the Asian and Hispanic and people of color. She said it was just the most beautiful mosaic of people. I've never seen such a diverse group of people, and I have never seen a church that actually had that level of di diversity. She said, but I felt like God was showing me what he had in plan for you, what he wanted to do with you. And when she said this, everybody was listening to her. We were all quiet. And all of a sudden, literally, kind of slightly off to the side, almost as if somebody was standing by the door that I had just locked up and stuff. And we had turned around and we were getting ready to go and she's telling me this. And everybody's quiet to listen to her tell us this, you know. And then all of a sudden, off to the side, we heard a voice say very clearly, very plainly, this, this was not a whisper. This was a, a very clear, audible voice. But it said, God bless you. Kind of like that. God bless you. And we start, I looked at Sister Johnson, and Sister Johnson looked, man, we started looking around. 
not a one of us recognized that voice. It wasn't one of our voices. It wasn't Brother Cumby. It wasn't Sister Johnson. It wasn't this Dominican lady. It wasn't my brother Dallas. It certainly wasn't me. And we heard it specifically coming from right over in this area. We were look and of course nobody's there. Well, I'd like to think that the Lord's angel was standing there and he spoke those words as a means of uh, confirming the dream that this lady had had. And I'd like to think for many years I thought, well, Lord, maybe that was your way of letting me know that her dream was genuine and you were trying to show her <coughs> something that you planned to do or that you wanted to do uh, through my ministry. And of course, all these years later, I'm still waiting. So uh, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I stepped out of God's will somewhere and missed the mark. But anyhow, so I'm here to tell you, uh, not for one minute did I think we were hearing from a ghost. Not for one minute did I think we were hearing from a demon. No. Uh, those of us that are Bible-believing, those of us who put our confidence in the sure foundation of God's Word, understand there's angels, there's demons, and they're both very much active in our world, just like they were in the Word of God, bringing people out of prison, delivering people, helping people, ministering to people. Even today, God still can use that medium to minister on our behalf. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, I need to close up our session today. Next week, we're going to continue our look at angels. Following that, we're going to be moving into the realm of demons. So next week, we'll sew up our look at the uh, angelic issue, and then we'll be moving on from there. I hope that this has been inspirational, encouraging, educational for you today. But let's go to the Lord together in prayer as we close this uh, session together. Master, Savior, Redeemer, King, Jesus, how we love you. Oh God, how wonderful the Word of God is, the inspiration, the hope. Oh my dear heavens, Lord, the encouragement that we receive from the word of the Lord, understanding, yes, there is a spirit realm, and so many focus on the demonic, so many focus on the evil, the wicked, and yet, Lord, at the same time, the word of God expounds for us very clearly that there is the realm of angels, hallelujah, and Lord, they are there to do your bidding. And you've sent some to simply uh, travel to and fro about the earth looking out for people. The Word of God talks about uh, guardian angels for children. And of course, Lord, we'll be looking at that more next week. There are so many wonderful truths in the Word of God. And if we will accept the sacred text as our sure foundation, if we'll understand and believe the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever, then we can know that in the moment of our greatest trouble and trial, angels of God may well be dispatched on our behalf to deliver to save. Hallelujah. Master, I pray, God, that this session, this Bible study tonight, would ring over and over again within our hearts. Lord, that it would echo in our spirits until we have come to a sure, fast understanding of the reality and the work of your heavenly messengers, your heavenly servants. Master, let people today who've been going through spiritual battles and spiritual difficulties, let them today, oh God, look to you, understanding that you have armies of angels ready to dispatch 
on behalf of their situation, on behalf of the enemy working within their marriage, the enemy working against their home, the enemy working uh, within their children, the enemy working within their community, within their church. Master today, O oh God, help us to understand, Lord, that the resources of heaven are beyond our wildest imaginations. And the enemy does not have ravenous demons roaming about and we're left out there without any hope and without any protection, no. But praise the name of Jesus, we have the heavenly host, the holy angels. Master, in the name of Jesus, keep us, O oh God, keep us in your care. Let the angels of God encamp round about those who fear you, who love you, who serve you. Master, in this time of division and strife, I pray, God, that you would send angels from heaven to minister in this country. Oh, God, how people have allowed themselves to be plagued by demonic forces of division and strife and angst and anger and hatred and racism and homophobia. Master, in the name of Jesus, your able Lord, to minister in these areas and to help us once again understand that our democracy works best when people of good will approach one another with civility, with kindness. We can disagree, but Lord, there is nothing, nothing we cannot work through. You've called the people of God to live peaceably. You've called us to be peacemakers and help us, Lord, to live that purpose, to be what you've called us to be. Master, keep us in your care until the next appointed time and bring us safely once again together so that we might worship you and lift up your name and receive from your wonderful sacred text. We ask all this tonight, O oh God, in none other than Jesus, 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 wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Thank you for being with us this evening. I hope that this session, session three, in our study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night, I hope this session has been uh, educational, inspirational, uplifting for you. And I hope you'll want to join us again next Wednesday at 7 p.m. as we continue this study. It'll go on, folks, for a couple of months. We're, we're going to be covering, if you can't tell already, I like to cover things in great detail. I like to make sure you understand that what I'm teaching is the Word of God and not just a bunch of you know, harebrained ideas and opinions. No, it's the word of the Lord. And so I like to study things with great depth, and that's how I teach. So I hope you'll come be with us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I also hope if you live in the Huntsville area, you will come worship with us on Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. You can go to our website, www forward clc all one word f o r w a r d c l c dot com and you can find our meeting uh, location sundays at three o'clock p.m if you attend other churches we are not opposed to folks visiting with us we enjoy having fellowship we enjoy having visitors uh, we are not a church that is seeking to proselyte so if you're in a good church and you love your church we want you to stay there but at the same time we'd be happy to have you visit uh, it would be an encouragement to us so if you're able come be with us sunday at three if you live outside of the huntsville alabama area then join us online sunday three o'clock central standard time as we uh, celebrate our life in Christ Jesus. Until we meet again, my friends, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.